Thank you and welcome back to the second segment of the show for today. The topic is the rise and fall of Adolf Hitler and we're fortunate to have with us to uh, talk about uh, the rise and fall of this great German uh, uh, individual, uh, Alana McLaughlin. And, and Alana, uh, let's uh, pick up where we left off the last time because I was thinking in terms of some of the things you said in reference to his background and et cetera, but speak to him uh, in reference to uh, however you wish. In the last segment, I talked about how Adolf Hitler's background had a very vital part in what made him the man that we know today. And so, well, I take that back, the monster that we know today. And so I basically talked about how he grew up in a normal household for that day and time. And he, nothing was really out of the, out of the ordinary up until both his parents passed away by the time he was the age of 19 and he was denied entry into art school. A lesser known fact about Adolf Hitler, he was really into art and he could draw. He could draw faces and buildings from memory, but when it came to drawing full bodies and copying off of something, he wasn't very good at that. And so he did not pass the test to the art school that he applied for and he was denied entry. So then at that point, both his parents were dead and he was homeless. Mm -hmm. So he was a homeless man for a while. He would live in, shelter, in shelters or on mattresses, wherever he could find, mm -hmm. or in, even in train stations. Then he decided to go back again and try to apply to art school again. He was denied entry once again. And so then again, he, so again, he was homeless, but he did get an inheritance from his sister that was supposed to be left for him when his mother passed. So then he did have a little money on him. So he decided to buy some new clothes and try to freshen up his life. He started attending anti-Semite meetings where he would listen to pe people speak about how Jewish people are gonna run Germany into the ground. And so then he started to get up and speak himself. And then he made a reputation of being a great speaker. He could get up and just talk and talk and talk. And a lesser known fact about Adolf Hitler, he had a problem with spitting. He would spit everywhere. But <laughs> um, nevertheless, he talked and he talked and talked. And so after he made this very good reputation of being uh, this great speaker, he started the Nazi Germany movement, basically, where he created the swastika, and, he, and people started to wear the swastikas as patches on them or on pins, and that's what really started the rise of Nazi Germany. He actually himself created the swastika? Swast swastika? Swastika. Yes. Or he was the first one to reveal it. No one really knows. But either way, he's credited for the swastika. And so Adolf Hitler, after being known as his great speaker, was arrested and put in a jail where he wrote his autobiography, Mein Kampf. Mein Kampf was so poorly written that a bunch of editors turned it down. And so he asked a couple guards while he was in jail and a couple other cellmates to help him re rewrite Mein Kampf. And then another fact about Adolf Hitler that a lot of people don't know, when he rose to power in Germany after being released from jail, he made every household in Germany own a copy of Mein Kampf. Every household had to have one. It was law and for birthdays or weddings you were supposed to give Mein Kampf as a gift and so he knew that unless he made people buy the book no one would buy it because it was poorly written it didn't have a lot of um, it didn't have a lot of punctuation and it had a lot of grammatical errors and so after the release of Mein Kampf he be just became known as this, this evil evil man and then he started to take movements against the Jewish people it started with um, things like um, burning down a synagogue and then making them clean it up and then pay for the damages. And then Hitler started to turn on his own guards. And so basically he would turn on the SS and he killed a lot of his guards and then made a whole new foundation of, of guards and future leaders, which really 
help jumpstart the Holocaust. And so with Hitler and his newfound army of these dolls, basically, he started what we know as one of the worst periods in history. He would have, oh, another fact about Hitler, he had training camps for children who wanted to grow up to be guards, like a part of the SS and et cetera. He would have Hitler like teen camps, he would have some for girls and some for males. And the girls would be taught, you know, how to stay at home and get pregnant and take care of children while their husbands would be taught, you know, how to fight and beat and shoot guns and et cetera. And so Hitler made this well thought out blueprint of how he wanted the world to be run and how he wanted to exterminate the Jewish people. Well, what was his uh, attitude? I mean, why was this attitude toward the Jewish population? I mean, what, what, what uh, created that kind of hatred for, uh, that he had for them? It's actually, that's up for de debate because a lot of people say that um, his hate for the Jews came from the man who denied him entry into art school who just so happened to be Jewish. Or um, it comes from how in the Bible, you know, the Jews killed Christ and he read that and just thought that he was going to take matters into his own hands and exterminate the Jewish people. But that's really a subject that no one knows for sure. And since Adolf Hitler killed himself when the war was over, no one really knows. And he doesn't really discuss it much in Mein Kampf, but he does make it very prominent that he does hate the Jewish people. And not only did he hate the Jewish people, he hated the Slavs, um, anybody who wasn't, you know, the blonde hair, blue eyed type that Aryan he liked, the, the Aryan race. And a thing about the Aryan race, there is no Aryan race. That's always been something that no one really knows. Mm -hmm. Aryan is supposed to be a part of a country or no, a part of a continent that houses these people. It's not necessarily, there's no real Aryan race. As a race, as a racial, ethnic. Yeah, group. there's no ethnic group that's mm. called Aryan. It's more of kind of just a group of people. But over time, that's become the definition of the people that Adolf Hitler liked. And so basically, Adolf just went off the deep end and he made it his life goal to terrorize anyone who didn't fit his criteria. And that's what he did for a while. Okay, so, and so let's take this uh, second commercial break and then we'll come back and we'll pick up on that last uh, 10 minute segment. And we'll be back with our audience following this very, very short uh, commercial break.
Thank you and welcome back to the final segment of the show for today. The issue is the rise and fall of Adolf Hitler and Alana McLaughlin has given us some information about his uh, rise and I think now Alana you will talk about uh, the fall and in real sense the demise of uh, Adolf Hitler. Let's do it from, from that perspective to bring in as much information as you can during this last 10 minutes dealing with uh, some, of the, some of the high points in reference to his life. So in the last segment, I talked about the um, Hitler and his crazy mindset, and I really went into the Holocaust. And now in the segment, I'm going to basically talk about more of the fall of Adolf Hitler and the aftermath. All right. So it's nearing the end of the war. The uh, guards of the concentration camps are, are know it's near the end of the war. They know the time is near that everything's about to be over. So they have the bright idea of trying to eliminate the, the lasting Jews and trying to make the Holocaust seem like it was all a hoax. So basically what they would do is they would kill off the remaining Jews in the death camps or concentration camps or in the work camps. They would kill them off and they would try to tear down as much of the camp as they could. Like for instance, Auschwitz. They killed the remaining people there and they tried to tear down Auschwitz as much as they could. But luckily they didn't t tear down the whole thing. So if you just so happen to find where it is, I mean, there are a few lasting bricks. But another fact about the Holocaust, some survivors who barely survived Auschwitz came back to the site where they were held captive, you know, over the years, and they would take a brick from Auschwitz and just keep it as, as memory. And the gate that says Auschwitz, um, it can be found in the U.S. Holocaust Museum, which I was fortunate enough to visit over the last couple of weeks. I, I went there about two weeks ago. And so in the, I'm going to talk about the Holocaust Museum for a second. In the museum, it has a very intricate setup. For instance, it has four floors, but you don't go, you know, you go one floor and you keep going up. You go to the fourth floor and you go down. So you get on this big elevator and they try to squish as many people in as they can to try to capture the essence or capture a, fra a fracture of the essence of how it would be in a, in a train car. And so this video shows up. On, on a screen in the elevator and it talks a little about the Holocaust but not very much because they don't want to give much away. So you ride up to the very fourth floor and in the fourth floor it just talks about the rise of Adolf Hitler, you know, mm -hmm. his childhood and you know the beginning of the Holocaust. But, when, um, but in a different section of the fourth floor it gets deeper into the Holocaust. So after you leave the fourth floor, you walk through a staircase or kind of like a little bridge where if you look out of a window, you can see the lower floors. But a fun thing about it is on the little glass panels of the museum, there are names of families that were involved in the Holocaust. So you'll see Horn and a lot of other names that were families of people who were killed in the Holocaust and they're all etched into the glass. So you walk across this bridge, you enter the third floor, which talks uh, more in depthly about the Holocaust. And they even have a uh, train car, and it's not even a replica, an actual train car that they had to have flown in and like dropped into the building, and they had to build the building around it. And so you can see that train car, and you walk through it where you can explore other divisions of the third floor. After that, you walk down a staircase, and if you look, out of a window by the staircase, it says, never forget, mm -hmm. always remember. And so you see more of those bold state, bold yet simple statements around the Holocaust Museum. And um, like for instance, outside of the uh, Holocaust Museum, like on a door, or not on a door, but on, a, on kind of a wall, the etched in it says, you are my witnesses. And it's a passage, it's a little scripture from I think Isaiah in the Bible. And it says, you are my witnesses. And so that really means that we bear witness for the people who can no longer tell their stories. And it is our duty 
as people who are living after this has happened to tell our children and for them to tell their children so that the memory of this is never forgotten because there are people out there and there are websites out there that try to chalk the Holocaust as a hoax and you can find and you have to be really careful where you look up information about the Holocaust because you will find a lot of sites like that they'll say um concentration camps never existed the Holocaust never happened mm -hmm. it was all fabricated it all was all a war tactic or something like that it's stuff that doesn't really make sense and so we have to bear witness to these people and so when you get done with the third floor you go to the second one and it has um, testimonials from people who happened to survive the Holocaust. Mm. And there's this one real popular testimonial about a woman who married the man who saved her, or a, a man from the army who came and, you know, rescued the people that were in her camp. And so after you take a walk around the first floor, you'll, oh, I forgot an essential part of the first floor, the shoes. It depends on what time of the year you go but you will see shoes from the Holocaust. Mm. There are children's shoes, women's shoes, and you see a lot of heels and stuff, and it really shows that these people didn't know what they were getting into, because who would wear heels to go work in a, a go die in a death camp? Mm. And so it really shows how these people were fabricated and lied to, only saying, oh, they would be going to work, and they just ended up being killed, and so- uh, They were just swept off the street by the uh, armies, and by Hitler's armies and placed into the uh, Holocaust. Either that or they were lied to and the whole Holocaust was sugar-coated. And another thing about sugar-coating, when um, the uh, Red Cross would come and inspect the camps, they would not wash them up beautifully. They would make it look like everyone was having fun. They would give, about a month prior to when the Red Cross would visit, they would give the, um, the workers food and lots of drink and stuff to kind of give them pounds because the life sent the life expectancy in a holocaust in a death camp or a concentration camp was 275 days mm -hmm. you aren't even going to make it a year and that's because they didn't feed you you just, you barely bathed you never had enough to drink and you basically didn't have all the basic human necessities that we as people take for granted nowadays and so they would clean them up and so that's why a lot of the world during this period was lied to. Mm. And only until it was too late did we realize what was happening because either a lot of stuff wasn't broadcasted or only the good stuff was broadcasted and it would just be lies. Mm. When we would see people smiling and just skipping along, these people were grieving the death of their children who were just thrown into furnaces mm. because they were marked incapable of work. Mm -hmm. And so, a lot of the world was really light too, and that's why the people that so many people died because so many there were African Americans there, there were Slavs and Gypsies and uh, Jews mainly, and so anybody who didn't fit Hitler's criteria, and like I said in the last segment, the Aryan race, which isn't really a race, but that's what we say today, the Aryan race. If you weren't the Aryan race, you weren't coming out alive, but. There was another way that a lot of people did manage to survive. Well, not a lot, but a fraction of people did manage to survive the Holocaust. They would get on boats and sail to different countries. And there is a, a, a story that's not really a story, but a famous incident where people got these fake passports and they sailed from Germany to Cuba. And at first Cuba was gonna let them in, but then Cuba changed their mind and did not let them in. So they sailed around the sea, not wanting to go back to Germany and everyone on the boat perished. Mm -hmm. And so all these people, and, and unless you had connections in America, then you could get out if you got a fake passport, you know, you f flew over there. And that's how a couple families mm -hmm. didn't manage to get out of the Holocaust. But besides that, it was a death sentence. There was no way you could escape Nazi Germany. And so in a real sense, Lana, you were able to get a real experience from uh, your visit to uh, the Holocaust uh, Museum, and, mm -hmm. and you would uh, advise and give, encourage everybody else to do the oh, same. Yeah. Oh, Is that what you'd say? And I forgot to mention the first floor and the very last floor of the Holocaust Museum says the Hall of Remembrance, and there's an everlasting fire, oh, and it's always reminding good. you to remember. And of course, uh, let me, uh, uh, and encourage you to uh, tune in again next week to another informative edition of comments. Thank, Thank you, you and, and good morning. morning.